Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and AP English and our World of Ideas lectures. We are in Unit 4. This is the topic called Mind. We are in the last essay of Unit 4. This is lecture number 24, Howard Garner's Multiple Intelligences. I have the full title, A Rounded Version, The Theory of Multiple Intelligences. Uh, hey, this is one of the most important single essays and ideas in regards to Room 303. Garner's work has been very influential in the way we approach education and learning in 303. Our very definition of learning is in large measure derived from the work of Gardner, and so I'm very excited to introduce you to this essay. It's, this essay is one of the reasons why so much of the work that we call learning in 303, we hope, has been influential in the lives of our students and obviously in my life as well. Now there are some assumptions here. If you haven't been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net, I very much recommend that you go and find the previous 23 lectures of ours uh, in the AP folder and the World of Ideas folder. Our assumption as well is that you're familiar and, uh, and working with our learning theory, right, since we were just mentioning it, that desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways, and Gardner will point out, very influential in 303 for us, is that we all have the capacity to do this connecting of new information to old information in meaningful ways. We just often do it in much different ways. So we have to learn to respect the ways in which each of us go about this thing called learning and the use of our intelligence. One of the significant things then is how we do that with our reading, the annotative approach, of course, active reading, looking for information that I can use. We do that in our reading, annotative process, by asking three guiding questions. What does the text say? What does the text mean? How can I relate to that text? At level one, just to remind, we're always working with paragraph outlining at level one, summarizing. What does the text say? At level two, we subdivide. At 2A, themes, messages, and what we call our big five. What does this text say about epistemology? What you can know. Ontology, who you are. Psychology, the working of the individual mind. Sociology, the work of collective minds. And then really important, theodicy, the question of evil in the world and suffering and pain. Why does it exist? I think we'll have a lot to hear from Gardner on this topic as well. At level 2B, we ask about rhetoric. Not what the writer says, Gardner, but how Gardner says it. We'll concentrate on that in a moment. At level 3A, how can I relate this information to other texts I already know? That will be significant. And finally, and really important, always important, but really important in this essay, how can I relate to this information in some personal way? Now let's do some quick biography. Born in 1943, still alive, so today at least 76 years young and going strong, an American developmental psychologist. He is, uh, works, continues to work at Harvard in the developmental site, uh, in the, in the uh, graduate school of education there. His projects are prodigious, prodigious. Pro um, uh, one just to mention, Project Zero, emphasizing creativity and thinking and problem solving in the classroom. He wants to cultivate always what he calls a culture of thinking as opposed to rote learning and memorization. Go back to some of our comments about uh, introduction to room 303 on the uh, learnstrong.net home site there. And you'll remember from those very early lectures we pointed out, learning is not just memorizing information. Getting information I can use, manipulate, it's a tool in some way. Obviously it's a tool to further my growth, my evolution if you will, right, as we've talked about it. Um, he did uh, win the MacArthur Foundation Award in 1981, written hundreds of, of research articles, over 30 books, uh, and the 1983 book was groundbreaking, uh, Frames of Mind, The Theory of Multiple Intelligences. We're actually going to be reading from uh, the uh, text, Multiple Intelligences, uh, The Theory in Practice from 1993. I just want to make some quick comments here um, as we get into this conversation um, that is that are specific to uh, what Jacobus has to say about Garner. I'm just with you on uh, 353. Um, perhaps, uh, uh, Jacobus says, perhaps the most important and best known project of Project Zero is the theory of multiple intelligences, which Garner first published in Frames of Mind 1983, as we said. In that book, he noted that the general attitude toward intelligence centers on the IQ intelligence quotient test that Alfred Binet, 1857-1911, devised. Binet believed that intelligence is measurable and that IQ tests result in 
numerical scores that are reliable indicators of a more or less permanent basic intelligence. Garner offered several objections to that view, thankfully. One was that IQ predictors might point to achievement in schools and colleges, but did not point to achievement in life. As we have often said in 303, you could be a smart, mean person, and that means you're a failure, no matter how smart you are, right? Scores, for example, of middling students performed at extraordinary levels in business, politics, other walks of life, while high-achieving students often settled for middling careers. The reports on high-performing executives indicated a considerable intelligence at work, but it wasn't necessarily the kind of intelligence that could be measured by the Binet IQ tests. Just to continue now on page 354, Garner also was intrigued by findings that local regions of the brain controlled specific functions of the mind. Neuroscience and neurology has, of course, come a long way in under helping us understand what learning is going on. For example, Studies have established that certain regions of the brain were specialized for language functions while others were specialized for physical movement, music, mathematics, other skills. When those portions of the brain suffered damage, as with stroke or accident, the functions for which they were specialized were adversarially affected. These observations, which were plentiful in the work of neurologists during and after World War II, led Gardner to propose the existence of a variety of intelligences rather than only one. Now, while your text and the, and the essay that we'll be working with qualifies at seven intelligences, Gardner and his group now qualify at least eight. And there are other theorists that speculate there's way more than that even, that there's a whole bunch of possible ways to think about intelligence. Now, the seven that we'll be working with, um, um, we'll, we'll get into in a moment, will of course lead us to ask some very personal questions at the end of this lecture in our reading. Namely, of course, where am I strong and where am I weak in regards to this notion of multiple intelligences? We'll get there, right? Let's go ahead now and talk a little bit about um, Gardner's rhetoric, right? Okay, by the way, just to finish Jacobus, because he does such a fine job of it, the last paragraph on 355 in regards to the introductory comments, Greeks, in the time of Plato and Aristotle, it's not, it, not going to shock us that Plato and Aristotle's name gets used over and over again, right? seem to have understood much of what Gardner says. They included music and dance, for example, in the curriculum of their schools. They developed linguistic and interpersonal skills in the teaching of rhetoric and made logic and mathematics central to their teaching. And of course, Socrates in Plato's Apology, the most, uh, or, I'm sorry, mentioned, or referenced in Plato's Apology and elsewhere. Socrates' most famous statements, in fact, know thyself, the Delphi Oracle, of course, admonishes us to develop interpersonal intelligence. Now, Gardner's rhetoric. This is, for most of my students over the years, one of the easiest essays they've ever, they've ever read. I think there's a reason for that. We have a tendency to read better and closer the things we're interested in, and right away Gardner is able to reach out in simple and direct prose to make this essay very accessible to you. One of the important devices pointed out by Jacob is, is enumeration. He has seven different kinds of intelligences he's going to talk about, right? And the reader, I'm quoting now, is not aware of a special range of importance to the seven forms of intelligence. The first, musical intelligence isn't necessarily the most important or the first to be recognized in an individual. Body kinesthetic is not necessarily less important because it comes after musical intelligence. By placing logical mathematical intelligence in the middle of the sequence, Gardner will suggest that this form of intelligence, which our society obviously traditionally treats as first of importance, could take, should take its place beside a range of intelligences that are all the more or less equal in value. To page 356, parallelism is important, right? Um, the, along with enumeration. We saw this as a rhetorical technique in our study of Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. You can go back and review there if you're so inclined. The structure of each of the intelligence that he will enumerate, he offers a subhead that identifies the specific intelligence then a quote-unquote sketch with a thumbnail biography that will in fact help establish the nature of the intelligence. Next paragraph. Gardner makes another important rhetorical decision regarding the size and the nature of the paragraphs. Notice this one. Modern readers conditioned by newspapers, magazines, expect paragraphs to be short and direct. Gardner's paragraphs reflect a decision to communicate with a general reading audience. This is huge. Rather than an audience of specialists or specially educated readers. For that reason, a single subject may sometimes be discussed in two or more adjacent paragraphs 
and with the paragraph break acting as a breather. The example here, of course, paragraphs 18, 19, 21, 22. To that degree, what we're really looking for, of course, is understanding, wisdom. Now let's go to work with the, uh, with the essay itself. By the way, notice a rounded version, the theory of multiple intelligences, is co-authored by Joseph Walters. Paragraphs 1 through 3. Intelligence tests given to children reliably predict their later success in school. Paragraphs 4 through 5. Such tests work as predictors because they measure what? Problem-solving skills typically needed for academic success. From this perspective, intelligence is a general ability that all individuals possess to varying degrees. Self-evident, yes? Paragraph 6 through 7. While accurately predicting academic success, intelligence tests are not good indicators of professional success in later life. Our society narrowly measures intelligence by a person's ability to solve certain types of logical and linguistic problems. Of course, there's a whole lot more to life than logical and linguistic problems. Therefore, schools should make sure that they are helping students evolve, grow, improve in all of the different intelligences that will be articulated. Notice that at the beginning of the essay, epistemologically, Garner is going to be arguing for the, for the relativist position. I'm sorry, for the fallibilist position, not the relativist position, or the absolutist position, right? He's going to make the argument, you can't predict everything from IQ tests, paragraph 8 through 9. Such an approach cannot account, that is to say the old school approach, cannot account for the extraordinary abilities of many people. This chapter, he's going to say, offers an alternative approach, the theory of MI, multiple intelligences. He says, we believe that intelligence consists of several different abilities and that all normal individuals possess each of these to some extent. Paragraphs 10 through 11, you'll notice we're working in the introductory materials, right? MI theory expands the traditional definition of intelligence. According to this theory, an intelligence, now we're going to get an operational definition, a capacity for solving problems or creating products valued by a culture. In other words, tools. Everything is about what you can use. It's a very pragmatic approach, by the way, very, we would say, American 21st century understanding, right? Late 20th century, early 21st century. Tell me something I can use. See, remember when you were maligned in middle school when you looked up uh, to your math teacher and said, when are we ever going to need this? Now, of course, let's be fair. You know that you have the answer now. It's called an ACT score. And if you paid closer attention to what your teacher was teaching you in 6th and 7th and 8th grade math, you might have scored higher, and that translates into more money. But let's be fair. That question, when am I ever going to use this? That is a legitimate question, and one that we try to honor, of course, in 303. The answer, of course, is, you'll never know. I just used the ACT as an example. You didn't realize the importance of it when you were in, uh, what, 6th, 7th, 8th grade. Now you understand the financial importance of it, don't you? Same is true for everything else in your life, right? Learn as much as you can because you never know when you're going to use it. Paragraphs 12 through 15. Before it can be regarded as an intelligence, a problem-solving skill must be universal in the human species, that is, biological in origin, and culturally nourished. We consider evidence from several sources and establish additional criteria in developing our list of intelligences. So the first 15 paragraphs of this essay are just introducing you to the way it once was thought of, intelligence, and now a new understanding, a new way. And this is, of course, very refreshing for a lot of my students who say, yeah, I haven't been the best reader or the best computer in mathematics, but that doesn't make me stupid, does it? It does not. It does not. And of course, as we pointed out about the ACT, you can go and look at our lectures on the ACT at learnstrong.net in that folder. Uh, hello, I don't care how smart you are, I can give you the test in Russian, and if you can't read Russian, your score on the ACT will probably plummet. See how that works? Everything is contingent. The ACT tests what? Not your intelligence, but your ability to take a test. Paragraph 16 and following. Here we go. The following section describes the seven intelligences we identified. So here we go. So let's get ready to go through them. Intelligence number one, paragraph 17 through 20. He begins with the violinist, uh, uh, Judy uh, Minhom. And he, it, uh, and he comments, he demonstrates an extraordinary musical intelligence. You can put it in your notes as music smart, as it sometimes is called. Evidence from various sources supports the interpretation of Musical ability as a separate intelligence. Very important form of intelligence. Paragraphs 21 through 24. He's going to use the baseball player Babe Ruth. 
possessed exceptional bodily kinesthetic intelligences, called body smart. Controlling complex body movements requires cognitive problem solving ability as well as physical skill. I remember once I was teaching this essay and a student just said out loud, whoa, so you're telling me because I can dunk a basketball over two guys that I must be intelligent? Dude, I never thought about that as intelligence. Gardner says, oh no, watch a dancer, watch a ball player, beautiful physical movement. This is important. It's an intelligence. And it can be utilized, right? It can be utilized in some way. Now, paragraphs 25 through 29. Let's work now. Biologists, Barbara Ma uh, Malcolintosh's uh, problem-solving ability is an example of logical mathematical intelligence. So let's go ahead, let's go ahead now and talk a little bit about this. This, by the way, is number and reasoning smart, we might call it, all right? This type of Problem solving can occur rapidly, and it may in fact be nonverbal. Logical mathematical reasoning along with language skill is the basis for traditional IQ tests. Of course, traditionally, if you're really good at mathematics, you're going to score higher on the ACT. Not a big shock, right? Of course, we do point out that if you score well on the ACT, high score on the ACT in mathematics, you often end up in some kind of math science discipline. And guess who makes a lot more money? The poetry major? or the engineering major. And see, we've talked about this when we talk about at LearnStrong.net, that lecture on the introduction to the 17th century and the scientific enlightenment and the differentiation of the value spheres and why all of a sudden it became a deal for you to spend more time studying in the math sciences. What Gardner's going to say is they're all important. They're all important. All right, let's go to paragraphs 30 through 31. Here we're going to talk about the great writer T.S. Eliot who, of course, is venerated in 303 for any number of reasons, right? He demonstrated exceptional linguistic intelligence. Word smart, we may call it. The ability to use language skillfully meets the various empirical criteria we use to identify an intelligence. The two, logical, mathematical, and linguistic, is obviously going to comprise the majority of the work that we do in school, right? Okay, and yet... We're not going to argue it's the only form of intelligence. No, not at all, right? But certainly important, no question about it. Paragraphs 32 through 36. People use spatial intelligence. This is picture smart is another way to think about it. People use spatial intelligence for tasks that require them to visualize and manipulate space. For example, navigation, map making, playing chess, drawing, painting, doing things like that. Research, he says, in biology and medicine verifies that Spatial reasoning is a distinct intelligence. The autistic child, Nadia, demonstrated prodigious visual ability in her drawings, for example. Paragraphs 37 through 44, Helen, Kellen, Helen Keller's teacher, Ann Sullivan, of course, miracle worker, one of the classic texts to talk about this, right, proposed an unusual, uh, possessed an unusual interpersonal intelligence. This is what we sometimes call people smart, right? This type of intelligence, which is verified by bio biological evidence, allows us to develop insights into other people and to interact with them socially. It's an interesting intelligence, often overlooked, but your capacity to be able to relate with other people is central to your success in life. No question about it. How about paragraphs 45 through 50? One of our favorite writers in 303, the writer Virginia Woolf, going to be uh, mentioned. She demonstrates exceptional intrapersonal intelligence, what we may call self-smart a deep understanding of her own self, an ability to use that understanding to guide her life. Again, as in the case with interpersonal intelligence, intrapersonal intelligence meets the criteria we established for defining an intelligence. No question about it. By the way, it's at this point that you should add in your list that there's an eighth intelligence that Gardner is going to add called naturalist intelligence, nature smart, and the capacity to be able to recognize the, the, the value of nature. Of course, others have gone on to point out there's all other kinds of intelligences as well that either build on these or somehow extrapolated from these. Sexual intelligence, spiritual intelligence, and on we could go. The beautiful thing about this model is that it's evolving all the time as we begin to think increasingly more right about notions of artificial intelligence and the idea about what machines can do is there a machine intelligence see we're starting to kind of play around with that idea let's finish now the essay and then our 2a uh, our levels 2 and 3 paragraphs 51 52 in identifying the seven intelligences we've used a non-traditional approach no question 
starting with the problems people solve uh, and then working back to the intelligences that enable them to solve those problems. Also, we've included a particular intelligence only if scientific evidence justified doing so. And again, after this kind of thing, there were a lot of people that began doing research to try and find other intelligences. Paragraphs 53 to 54. We have shown that, to some extent, each of the seven intelligences functions independently of the others. Nevertheless, any sophisticated role in society requires that we use a combination of the seven intelligences. No doubt about it, and we'll link some of these observations now in our final comments. Let's go to work. Level 2A. What does this text say about, in our Big Five, epistemology? Well, I think Garner is really arguing for the fallibilist position. Instead of just being absolutely certain that IQ tells us everything, he says it this way. You know, let's be a little bit more inclusive in the way we think. And about our position, let's say, scientifically, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. Let's go to work with the idea and see how it works. Of course, this epistemological position of the fallibilist position is far more liberating, isn't it? And it gives us hope that we can continue to find new ways to do this thing called learning, which is the whole reason we're here, right? What does this text say about ontology? Well, it says that we are very complicated. We're not so simple, after all, when we try to reduce intelligence down. And to that degree, multiple intelligences remind us that we are an amazing species with all kinds of ability. To that degree, psychologically, what's this text say? Well, no question. Our fears and our anxieties can limit us. And sociologically, of course, yeah, you can, you can have people that, for example, will take a look at an ACT score and decide whether you're intelligent or not. Way wrong answer. Way wrong answer. As we said, we could give you the test in Russian. Wouldn't demonstrate at all anything because obviously you don't read Russian unless you do, right? That is to say, sociologically, what's this text say? Everybody has intelligences. Everybody. And to that degree, we should respect everyone. This is why we'll never call somebody dumb because they're incapable of doing some stupid assignment. No, 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 no. Silliness. Absolute silliness.